Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today, this time, we are really going to bend your brain around because it's time to really get what we mean by the Big Bang. The Big Bang is actually a description of how the universe expands. So we have all sorts of observational evidence concerning the expansion of the universe, from Hubble's observation of expanding galaxies to galactic evolution that we've seen with clusters of galaxies, as well as the evolution during the collisions. We've also seen that galaxies themselves getting uh, colliding with each other and moving through time. So things do change with time. So it seems also Kind of natural that space itself might change with time. That might not seem really natural on the surface, but we're un but it's an unavoidable consequence of general relativity and an unavoidable consequence of the solutions to exactly how, what Hub Edwin Hubble found with the expansion of the universe, and has been subsequently seen by many, many, many astronomers ever since. In fact, there's been nobody who hasn't seen it when they go and look. So the Big Bang is based off the concept of the expanding cosmos. So now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of exactly how Lemaitre and Friedman and Hubble and Einstein actually got to the place where they said, well, it's got to be expanding. So here we go. I'm going to respect your brain by giving you the reality behind it. All right. The expansion of the universe was observed to be expanding today, and so we use that as Hubble's law. An interesting element of it, as the universe expands, it cools. So if you went back in the past, it must be smaller, hotter, and denser than it is today. Now what do we mean by cooling? Well, if you take any kind of uh, a box of gas, say um, like a t car tire or something like that, or a bicycle tire, you want to have some fun, Take your drive your car to the gas station, and then uh, just let it sit for a bit, go get a Coke, come back in, uh, and then let all the air out of one of your tires, just because. I mean, why not? You can put it back in for just a few seconds, for a few minutes. Um, so what you do is you're going you're gonna to deflate your entire car tire, and then you go grab your coffee, come back out, and then in touch the car tire. Now it should be about room temperature or air temperature, it won't be very warm, and do this on a rel not a hot day or anything like that, and you want to make sure you haven't been driving so the tar isn't, car isn't, isn't, isn't hot. And then you quickly inflate the tire. Now the tire will be hot because you've taken air and compressed it inside the tire. And when you compress a gas, it heats up. If you compress the universe, the gas of galaxies will get closer together and therefore bump into each other in reverse, in time reverse, and so therefore must have been closer together and therefore must be hotter. All right, so ago it was smaller, denser, and hotter than today. If we run the clock backwards far enough, the universe should be very small and extraordinary high density, and it also should be very hot and opaque. And what we call this initial very hot, opaque, dense state is the Big Bang. It also can be called a primeval fireball. There's a lot of other names for it. But the Big Bang was coined by, I believe, Fred Hoyle on a, on a British television show, on a British radio show, when he thought that it was a terrible idea. And he said, well, the universe began in some kind of crazy Big Bang, and it stuck. So we're stuck with the Big Bang. It's kind of a good name. The foundations of the Big Bang are, are, are very deep, and they begin in the 1920s, and they continue today. It's an infinite, the concept is that you have a nearly infinitely or infinitely dense hot universe. Infinite is such a horrible word. Just arbitrarily highly dense and hot universe in the past. And then you get three basic things that assume that. One, we talked last time about homogeneity and isotropy and the relevance of general relativity as an explanation for gravity, as well as, as, well as its description of the nature of space-time itself. The universe is, be, is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales, which means general relativity is valid everywhere. And the, the energy of the vacuum, meaning the cosmological constant, is tiny or small. And that's why, uh, that's why it doesn't seem to have much of an effect. Every one of these ideas, is assumptions, is testable. And that makes it valid science, because you can't have science if you can't test it. And so that's really what we need to know about. Can we actually test it? And the answer is yes, we can test it. So let's see what those tests are. But we're going to go through a very detailed consequence of what we mean by the Big Bang. 
detail. The Big Bang is a testable model. So the really important thing about the nature of science is that there's empirical data which you take and then you explain the universe with physical laws and you don't try to create new physics unless you run out of ideas and then you try to describe it with how you see it to behave and hopefully you'll find some underlying physical idea that it fits into. Otherwise, you might just find some new interesting phenomenon that is a result of the underlying physics, which is cool too. So we have then the most important thing is, is that you create a testable model. That testable model then has predictions for what you have for the empirical data. If the data does not fit the model, then the model's bad. If the model is bad, you don't use it anymore. Here's a bad model for the universe. The bad model for the universe is it is a big box supported by turtles. And so you look for the bottom of the box and you look to find, oh, dig a hole in the bottom of the box. Do you see some turtles? Oh, you don't see any turtles. Well, darn it. That's not a good model for the universe. The, the question then becomes, does the Big Bang model explain the properties of the observed universe? And that's what we're going to find out. What is this model? As the universe expands, Space gets stretched in all directions from all points. Sometimes people just say it gets stretched in all directions, but it's important because it's, a, it's isotropic as well as homogeneous that space is getting stretched in every direction as seen from all points in space. That's critical. Matter is carried along with this expanding space, and the distances between galaxies are getting larger, physically larger with time. So the Big Bang predicts Hubble's law, and we're going to see how that happened. It ex predicts it exactly for recession speeds that are small compared to the speed of light. Hubble's law, remember, is a relationship between the speed of recession and the distance, and that's if it's close by. The farther away you get, uh, Hubble's law doesn't work anymore because it's no longer a linear relationship, and that's what we're going to find out soon. The more descriptive, when you get, in order to look at large cosmological distances, we need a major description of what we mean by the geometry of space-time. That really makes people angry. It's like, how can space have geometry? Well, take a topology class or you know, take a geometry class and you'll find out the nature of that stuff. So space-time itself has a geometry. Let's see what it looks like. The cosmological redshift is really important. It says that space stretches light waves and the wavelengths get stretched longer and longer and therefore they become redder and redder because light itself has a length associated with it inside itself. So as the universe stretches, that gets stretched with time. The redshift of an object gets larger with increasing distance. That's the mo that is a critical observation. The Big Bang it naturally explains this cosmological redshift and distinguishes it from normal Doppler shifts doing to, no, doing to motion. So the Big Bang says, hey, I'm going to stretch that space-time. You can wiggle around you want all you want on top of space-time and fall in terms of gravity towards each other, but I'm going to drag you along as best I can, and that's the Big Bang. So when we think about cosmic look-back time, we say how far back in time we can see when we look at the sun, we see the sun eight and a half minutes ago because that's how long it takes light to get here from there, and that's the astronomical unit. But we're looking much further back in time when we look in cosmological distances. Cosmological distances means we're looking up back millions or billions of years in the past. So as we get the light, we're actually seeing things as they were billions of years ago. So this is actually good. We're not seeing them as they are. We're seeing them as they were. So if we have a model, a model of how things should look and how things should be, hey, should behaving ago, then we can model it in the past. So we actually can see the past. We just have to look at fainter and fainter and fainter objects and trust that redshift is actually telling us that we're looking farther and farther and farther back in time. That's what we can do. So this allows us to paint a history of the cosmos by looking farther and farther in the past. So the deeper into space we look, the, the fainter the objects we see, the higher the redshift, the farther back in time we see, and then we can actually see what the universe was like long ago. The shape of the universe is also important because everything attracts each other due to gravity. So gravity as formulated by Newton is purely attractive. 
but the uh, but Einstein's theory of relativity allows for gravity, which is a description of space-time instead, as I described in previous lectures, as a description of space-time. It allows for space-time to actually do things differently and have you are allowed to create things inside the equations that would have a repulsive effect, but you have to have the stuff to do it, and that's kind of a weird thought, but. Newtonian gravity is modeled and is a subset, a very large subset of general relativity, but it is a limiting factor of the equations of relativity. Now, we also know that relativity says that energy is equivalent to mass. So no matter what you have in the universe, matter and energy are the same thing. So anything that has energy density, whether it's mass in a box or light or anything else that you can possibly imagine that has energy density, it will affect space-time because all of that stuff goes into what tells space-time how to curve. And all of this stuff put together determines the global geometry. Now then, it's time to respect you and your brain because now I'm going to show you exactly what all these words mean. This is like three sentences, but hey, let's just see what this means. Time to respect your brain. All right, let's go back. Let's take it back, a ways back. So how does redshift measure the expansion? Let's make sure we're on the same page here. The definition of redshift says, let's make a little triangle, assume little galaxies are at each of the points of the triangle, and then the scale factor, let's call it, is what we're going to do. So a go, the scale scale factor was say 1 and then that's then and now we're going to expand the triangle and as we expand the triangle we've doubled the size of the triangle and as we've doubled the size of the triangle now the uh, the scale factor now is 2 since we've doubled the triangle and so if we look closely at it we say that the that all of the points have separated from the center or from each other every length has doubled it hasn't expanded from a place. Remember, each one of these things has expanded away from each other because the, dis the distance of each side has gotten bigger by a factor of two. This is what we define to be the redshift. The redshift, as we saw before, is a direct relationship between this scale factor growth. All right, so we can then associate the stretching of space-time because light has a wavelength, and so we can now stretch the wavelength of light by stretching space. And um, I snuck in that equation that shows how redshift is related to the wavelength of light, and now I'm going to sneak it around even more by saying, oh, how did we get that? The side of each triangle grows. That's the R sub 1, 2, and 2, 3, and 3, 1. Those are the points 1, 2, 3 on the corners. And the scale factor grows as a function, and that's that parenthesis t means as a function of time. So this distance between point 1 and 2 or 2 and 3 and 3 and 1 grows as a function of time and that function of time is the scale factor a as a function of time and r 1 2 or 2 3 or 3 1 as a function of t0 well what it's not really a function of t0 it's as measured initially so the blue triangle or the purple triangle and so r 1 2 at a later time t is the green triangle, the aquamarine triangle that's bigger. And so we've just jumped a sub t from 1 to 2. Now we've jumped it, but how does it go with time? That's a real question. How does the thing behave with respect to time? Does it grow linearly? Does it grow quadratically? Does it grow exponentially? Does it go up and down and up and down? Is it like a sinusoidal function? Does it go to the cube power? What the heck does it do? How does a have a function of time? We haven't answered that question. We don't know yet. Let's find out, because that's the observational thing. So then we say, fine. We then say how fast it's growing with time, and that's the rate of change that, say, one of the sides, we're isolating one because it's three equations, and I want to write it all out. The R sub 1, 2 is the distance between points 1 and 2 on the triangle, and D dr12 is a little change in our, the distance as a function of time compared to the little change in time. So dr12 says, make it a little bit. And then dt says, in a little bit of time. And that is the rate of change, or what we call the derivative, and that we can hyphenate and call our a dot, which is how does the scale factor change with time? And the dot is just a really shorthand way of saying dA sub t dt. That's what I mean by the dot. And so now we got, we have, if you look closely at it, we can, we can then say that 
R sub 1, 2 is actually uh, the, fung the velocity or the speed, V sub 1, 2, the speed with which the, the triangle side is expanding is, equal, is proportional to the distance and the, dist the length of the initial of the triangle times the scale factor as, it's fung as it changes with time compared to the initial size. So what is that A dot of A? That A dot of A is actually just the Hubble parameter. So the speed with which the thing is expanding is equal to the Hubble parameter. So A dot over A is defined to be the Hubble parameter. That's what, that's what Hubble measured. Because now we're looking at this distance, the rate of change of two things. So now we've related the scale factor's rate change to the Hubble parameter, and the speed is the redshift. So we got redshift, we got the, uh, the redshift is the speed, and that is the, related to the stretching of the wavelength, which is related to the scale factor, which is related to the Hubble parameter, and all these things are related. So basically, if you measure the redshift, you're measuring the Hubble parameter. All right, so that's what we need to know. All these linked equations just simply tell us that the redshift is a measurement uh, and the knowing the measurement of the redshift and knowing the distance gives you the Hubble parameter which is how the scale factor changes with time. And exactly how the scale factor changes with time is extraordinarily complex but I'm going to break it down for you and that's what we're going to do right now. We need to say how gravity figures into all this stuff. So gravity says force is a mass times an acceleration. Great. So we've got a mass times an r double dot. See, I'm getting rid of those dtts, so I'm saying how fast does the distance change as a function of time. So r double dot is the acceleration. That is the rate of change of the rate of change of the, di of the, scale, of the size. So now the force due to gravity might be say, hey, we got two things. They're separated by a distance r. One of them's got one little mass, and one of them's got one big mass. And so that's equal to the rate of change, the acceleration of the little thing. And that says, oh, how fast is the, how fast is that rate, that distance accelerating? How fast is that thing changing as, how fast is the rate of change rate changing? That's what R dot means. So then we can say, what's the mass of everything? We can, we can break it all together. The mass of all the things that are pulling on the little guy is equal to uh, some, we're assuming a spherical distribution. So we have a little bitty dot on the surface of a big, 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 big sphere. And we pretend we're seeing how that big, 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 big sphere changes with time. And that's where the 4 thirds pi a r cubed goes. And we then multiply it by the density of the stuff. So the mass of the entire thing inside the sphere on which the little guy is riding as the sphere is either expanding or contracting. So now we got an expanding sphere and, a, and we have a little bitty guy on the surface like an ant riding on a big ball. And that's what little m is. Little m is the ant riding on the big ball and m could be m sub all is like the big ball underneath the ant. So the density the how fast the object is growing is the scale factor. And that's the radius. So uh, a, the uh, big R is simply the scale factor times some initial value of the radius of the ball, which is little r. So we've got our scale factor again. And now we're going to make the big ball ex expand. And if we combine the mass and the density and the force due to gravity and the scale factor together, we get uh, a series of equations. So there's two possibilities that we're going to find out that the universe could either expand forever or it can contract. So we look at this ball as its scale factor and it's gravitating on itself because now we've got a ball that's expanding and either the gravity wins and the ball starts to collapse back down on itself or the ball the, it, the ball expands forever because there's not enough mass to pull it back. That's what we care about. The ball itself is the universe. We're making a toy universe, and the little m is the little ant on the surface of the universe. So all of the mass that's underneath the little ant is pulling on the ant, as though it were as though it we're just uh, is at the center. And the rate of change, the r, the big r double dot, is the acceleration or deceleration of the rate of uh, of the radius of the ball on which the ant is standing. So, universe ball, ant on surface. How fast is ball expanding, and is it expanding 
Is it accelerating, decelerating, or staying constant? So there's really only two events, ways it can go. It can either expand forever, or it can collapse eventually. Or there's some really limiting value between them, where it just barely expands forever, but if it got a little bit less, then it would collapse. So it would collapse if there's a lot of mass, right? Pulling it back together. If it's, if it's not a lot of mass, mass of all is small, and so therefore the density is small, therefore the rate of the, it doesn't overcome the expansion. So we can think of it as expanding from a point. All right, so here's our three possibilities. Either in the past it was small, expanded to today, and sometime in the distant future, either it'll pull back on itself and collapse bound down to nothing, or it won't. And those are two, only two possibilities because the force due to gravity on the entire universe will either pull it back or it won't. That's the, that's the thing about an expanding universe. Either, either it'll stop or, or it won't. All right, there we go. So let's respect you even further, and we're going, to, we're going to integrate those two equations that we saw in the previous thing, where we linked the density and mass and the force due to gravity. We pile them together, and we get the equation above the green line. So we're taking a really basic concept that the force due to gravity is pulling on a spherical distribution with a density rho, and that rho is that little p. And we also see g, which is Newton's gravitational constant, 4 pi, three, 4 pi over 3, is because of spherical distribution. So we have r double dot and r, which are the scale factor sizes of the cosmos. That's just some scale size of the universe, or the radius of the universe, which is an interesting way of talking about it. And if we play around with that and add in the Hubble parameter, we get the two equations below. Now I'm not going to go through the whole derivation of that. That's a that's an enormous derivation. I'm just going to I'm I'm going to wave my hands here and allow you to go play and look with that. But the important thing is is that we can actually we we're saying the scale factor, right? So the scale factor shows is and is all about the density is all about well, the scale factor is all about a and a goes into the definition of the Hubble Hubble parameter which is the h thing so somewhere in there we should be able to say how the density parameter is changing as a function of time and if we play around with it we find that we have two equations and the two equations we have are actually identical, and I'm going to show you where the second one comes from in a bit. But the first one is the middle equation that I'm showing you, which says the Hubble parameter as a function of time squared is equal to 8 pi now times the gravitational constant divided by 3 times c squared, which is the speed of light, times the density, energy density of the entire universe as a function of time. That's what that epsilon means. And then the second term we're subtracting from is some kappa is called kappa c squared over r r naught squared a as a function of time squared. Kappa is the curvature constant, and it's only three numbers. Either it's one, minus one, or zero. C again is the speed of light squared. R naught r sub zero squared is the curvature of the universe measured to, or the radius, the scale size radius of the universe today, and a as a function of time is the scale factor of the universe as a function of time. So the Hubble constant, the Hubble constant, not the Hubble constant, the Hubble parameter as a function of time depends on epsilon as a function of time, which is the energy density as, as the universe goes. It also depends on the scale factor, how the scale factor itself goes as a function of time. The, all the other things are constants. G is Newton's gravitational constant, C is the speed of light, and R is the, si is the characteristic size scale of the universe today, R sub naught. The second equation reframes the one above it, the third equation on this thing, it reframes the one above it, but in terms of the density of the universe. Okay, so let's actually, that's what that omega is, and that's what you'll see in the literature, and that's what textbooks show, and all sorts of silly things like that. So that's what omega is about. So let's see why we use an omega. So first, let's look at that equation more carefully and see where we get that from. Let's pretend for a second in the equation above that we set kappa, the, cur the curvature constant, equal to zero. Let's also set the Hubble parameter equal to today's value. 
in the entire universe. Not yesterday's value, but the value we measure today locally in the universe. So then you get the epsilon today. An epsilon today is a very, or today with no curvature, is a really important number. And that's equal to h naught squared over g over g. And that is, h naught is measured, is the thing that Hubble measured, which we know roughly today is about 70 kilometers per megaparsec, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and g is Newton's gravitational constant. But let's now say, define omega as a function of time, which is the density parameter. The density parameter as a function of time is equal to the epsilon sub t, which is the density, energy density of the universe as a function of time, compared to this new made up number, which is the energy density today if there were no curvature. That's what the omega stands for. So we're going to reframe it, and that's kind of important because that'll tell it, because if you reference things to today, you get some good stuff. And if we reference it to no curvature, it actually tells us some important things about the rest of the rest of the equations. So that's the definition of omega, the capital omega as a function of time. It is a it's the energy density as a function of time, epsilon of t, compared to the energy density today if there were no curvature. So that that's e sub to e of today in the wind above it. That's where we get these two equations. They're equivalent equations, and really they're the same thing, just parameterized with that omega instead. The density parameter is actually the cosmic dictator because it tells everything, and depending on the curvature, it tells everything, and it also even dictates a lot of stuff. So let's pretend that the curvature is now plus one. The curvature can only be plus one, minus one, and zero in this formulation of these equations. If it is plus one, we have a positively curved universe. And the density parameter, therefore, is always positive. Because if you look at that, say, oh, if, if, if camp is positive, everything else is a square, so those things are all positive, and then we move it to the other side of the equation and move cat, epsilon, uh, omega to the other side, that number must always be positive. So we call that, the density parameter is always positive, and if it so happens that the omega is greater than one, the expansion will eventually turn around and collapse, and we call that a closed universe. All right, cool. Next, make the curvature negative one. If it's negative one, we call that a negatively curved universe, and, the, and if the density parameter, after you munge it around, is less than one, then we will then the universe will expand forever and we'll call that an open universe so make kappa negative 1 the thing on the right hand side of the equation in the, in the lower equation is positive Ex put the uh, omega on the right hand side and then shift it over to the left and we find that maybe maybe the other thing can then be the kappa is now just now negative 1 so it actually is ignored so if the density parameter is less than one, that thing could in theory be greater than one, but pretend it's less than one, the universe then is, will expand forever and it's what we call an open universe. Finally, we look at the limiting case where we make the curvature zero and we set the time today and that gives us the special parameter for epsilon, the density parameter, which we call the critical density and that is really important. So let's take a look at that for just a second and we, we, we rename epsilon to rho and we call 3 h naught squared. So let's go, we're going back to that definition, right? And then we say that it's equivalent. We, we actually plug in the numbers for 3 h naught over 8 pi g and we get a value that's a pro that's a really tiny amount in kilograms per cubic meter but if you make it solar masses per megapart cubic megaparsec it's kind of big that's about that's about the same size as one milky way's worth of mass in a megaparsec that's kind of what we see that's interesting so this critical density parameter, which is, an, which is a mass density, which is an energy density, is actually equivalent to kind of what we see is in every cubic megaparsec, one Milky Way galaxy. That's what 1.27 times 10 to the 11th solar masses per cubic megaparsec means. That's a lot. 
That's 100 million, 100 billion solar masses, 127 billion solar masses in a cubic megaparsec, which is about the mass of the Milky Way. So we can then define a new thing called omega sub naught. And omega sub naught says, take the average density of the universe that we see today, whatever that is, and compare it to this critical density, whatever that which, which we just are showing above, and that's the value of the average density now and the critical density now, which is the number above, uh, rho c at rho c comma naught. That is the that's a very important number to measure is the average density compared to the critical density today. Today, now, today. Not two billion years in the past, but today. So the cosmic density parameter really dictates a lot of things. If it's a high density universe, uh, if the average density is greater than the critical density, then it shall be positively curved and it shall collapse. If, the, if omega sub naught is measured to the average density is less than the critical density, it will be a negatively curved universe and it will be open and it will expand forever. The funny thing is, what if it's a critical density universe and the universe is flat, meaning omega sub naught equals one? We express that in terms of density parameter, and that is a spatially flat universe. So let's look at these things in detail. So a major quest in all of cosmology is to determine the cosmic density compared to the critical density. That's what the omega sub naught is. And if we have omega sub naught greater than one, that's a positive curvature, and it's like being on the surface of a sphere. If that's the case, then, divert, then parallel rays eventually converge, and there is then the geometry of space-time would be spherical. That's an interesting space-time. But it has measurable consequences. The space-time would be positively curved, and so then light rays would eventually collide if that is the case. Next, if it's negative, if the geometry, if, if the uh, density parameter is less than one, it's negatively curved. And it's an infinite hyperbolic universe. The hyperbolic curvature is every point in the universe has that shape. Not just one place, but every point in the universe has that shape. So you really can't represent it very easily. The fun part about this is that every light ray diverges from every other light ray. They don't stay on straight, the straight lines diverge and get farther and farther and farther apart exponentially in this kind of universe. And so they diverge rather than get closer or stay parallel. Well, in parallel in what we think. However, in a critical density universe, we find that parallel light rays do stay parallel. They stay in what we would say is in our normal sort of 10th grade geometry sort of thing where they stay parallel. Universe expands forever, but just barely. All right. Fun thing about a closed universe, if it exists, shine a flashlight, look around behind you, you see the flashlight hit you from behind. Kind of neat. But unfortunately, and this was kind of the thought of the thought of things, that the universe was thought to be closed in the 1990s. And that was an interesting thought. And the radius of curvature was thought to be extraordinarily large, but the idea was that if we thought that the universe must be closed because of the there were various pieces of logic and reasoning and observational thoughts, as well as kind of a, let's not make the universe infinite in extent, let's make it kind of a thing, because that would be weird, because where's what does infinity mean? We don't really know. So let's hope it's closed. Unfortunately, it's not. All right. So... How do we know what the density of the universe is? That's the question on the table. And ignore the, the equation at the bottom. Just look at the one in the middle. Ignore the one at the bottom. We'll get to it shortly. But the, equation, but the critical density parameter is just a sum of all the stuff in the universe in a typical box around us. So we have all sorts of parameters that go into it. Okay, so what are these parameters? And we have the we have uh, omega sub c, omega sub b, omega sub rad, omega sub k, and omega sub lam lambda. Omega sub c is cold dark matter, and that's kind of an, or or cold dark matter that might be dark matter. And b is is cold baryonic matter or normal matter like atoms and molecules. Uh, rad is radiation like neutrinos and light. 
k is curvature, meaning the curvature density, the, the density of the curvature of the universe itself provides energy density, and energy density due to cosmological constant lambda. So dark matter, C, normal matter, B, radiation like light and neutrinos, rad. K is curvature, meaning the universe itself provides space-time curvature, and that might have a de energy density, and lambda. So here's what we really think it is. We think there's not much due to radiation. We can tell that the energy density of the radiation is not very big. And we also think that the curvature uh, contribution is almost nothing. So if we take the cold dark matter and baryonic matter, and we call them just little m for like matter, we combine those two into one, and we retain the, the lambda, we really actually think that the, that the current critical density is one. We think it's flat or really close to flat. So let's start with that as an idea, and we're going to actually show in future lectures how we know that that's actually true, or at least how we think it really is very close to one. If not one, it's really close to one. And that has real problems for everything else later. All right, so let's see what we mean. If we take the Hubble parameter and, dive, and digest it and push it through and see how all of the things actually affect the Hubble parameter, we say, well, how does each density parameter affect the Hubble relationship? So Hubble factor as a function of the scale factor, instead now of time, but of the scale factor A, this is how all of these pieces deal with it. The universe is about 13.8, I should make the 13.799, that's the, that's the Planck thing, but heck, there's so many, there's a lot of ways to measure it, but 799 is the most, 13.799 is the Planck measurement from 2015. Anyway, let's keep going. So these, uh, these various parameters inside the big sum each have a meaning, and they all are part of the great cosmic recipe of what makes up the universe and how they affect the rate of expansion of the cosmos. Let's look at each one in turn. So this is the Hubble constant, or if it were set to today, we would just call it h sub naught. But now we're going to say let the Hubble constant vary as a function of time, or really now a function of the scale factor, how big the universe is. All right, so then we that's defined in terms of the a dot, which is the how the Hubble how the scale factor goes as a function of time compared to the scale factor. Each of these are of course squared. Dun dun dun. And now we have the next bit, which will be the Hubble parameter. And the Hubble parameter then says there's the Hubble constant. We extract it out of that. So how does each of these things vary with time? So we're just going to take the Hubble constant out of there and put it through time. So how does, how does each of these things go? So that's a Hubble constant. That's today's measurement. So we can measure that. We don't need to measure other stuff too. Great. This is the density of cold dark matter. Dark matter, stuff you can't see, doesn't do light at all, but really does everything else. So cold dark matter and B is baryonic or normal matter like atoms and molecules. And that how that stuff changes with time, how its energy density or its density changes with time varies as the scale factor cubed. You put stuff in a box, make the box bigger, and just spread it out, the stuff is more spread out. The bigger the box, the more spread out it is. So the density varies as the scale factor cubed. That's why it is a cubed at the bottom. Because it's normal matter. You take its, its density and you stretch the box it's in, you drop its density by, by the cube of however much you've expanded your box. Next, we have how radiation goes, like light. Remember, light gets expanded with the box, but it also gets stretched. And as it gets stretched, the light gets stretched. But we also know that the, pro that the energy of a photon is proportional to its wavelength. So therefore, we have to add in, oh, and this is energy density. So we have to say, oh, its energy density also drops with an additional scale factor to the fourth power because the energy drops as it gets stretched. If the energy of light did not change when the wavelength got stretched, then we wouldn't have a four, we'd have a three, and it would be dumped into the previous one. But that's not the case. Radiation drops off as the, as the scale factor to the fourth power because its energy drops as its wavelength gets stretched. Third, 
the curvature of space-time itself has energy, and it would also contribute to the overall rate of expansion, but it does so as the scale factor squared like a surface density. So we can think of the curvature of space-time as the surface density of space-time, which is kind of weird. It's kind of like a surface tension or something like that. That's kind of a good way of thinking about it, but it drops off like a surface area. Okay, finally we have this component that we will call dark energy instead of lambda because that's what we're calling it nowadays, dark energy, cosmological constant. We really don't know what it is, but we're going to add, we're going to say, yes, it's going to drop off as the cubed, but then we're going to tack on a, a very strange thing. We're going to multiply that 3 by 1 plus w. Why? Because um, fish. No, because it actually allows us to set w to something, and when we set w to something, we can then change the value of how it goes. So depending on the, the type of thing that dark energy is, we can set it to something. All right. We think that it is a cosmological constant. So if it's a cosmological constant, we can set w to minus 1. If we set w to minus 1, 3 times 0 is 0. a to the 0 power is 1. So we get a constant. So there are good reasons to think that it's close, that w is close to minus 1. In fact, that is something that is actually measured as a parameter from the, cos, from the cosmic microwave background, which we'll get to in a future lecture, so it becomes a cosmological constant. This is what we call a tension in space-time. It is a tension that pulls space-time apart. Notice how this works. If every other one of the things were gone, it would just say, hey, I'm going to, I'm just going to, the Hubble's bit constant, you're going to grow. You're going to grow according to me if I'm positive. I'm going to, I'm going to push you apart larger. If I'm negative, I'm going to push you apart. I'm going to make you go uh, smaller. So it's a tension pulling space-time apart if the cosmological constant is a positive number. All right, so if you go in a textbook and say, how does everything evolve with time? We have radiation dominated, matter dominated, dark energy dominated. How does this equation work with time? And you see graphs like this in textbooks and online. So let's see what these kind of graphs really mean. And they come from that equation. So in the very, 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 very early universe, when everything was small and packed together, all of the terms of the equation were small except for the radiation version. Because if you take A and make it really tiny, then it be, the reciprocal of it becomes really large compared to the others. So the only thing that matters as A becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, approaching zero, because we think of the scale factor as zero at the beginning, or close to zero at the beginning, and one today, and getting larger than one in the future. So let's let A get really, 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 really small compared to one. So therefore, radi omega radiation term grows to be much larger than all the other terms. And that's what we mean by radiation density dominated, or radiation dominated. The energy density due to radiation is much greater than all other contributions combined. So you can just look at the at the at the universe uh, growing or or shrinking or growing at a, as as the as the scale factor of the fourth power, and that's how the radiate that's how the universe was growing during that time, and that's approximately for the first ten to the fifth years or the first hundred thousand years, couple hundred thousand years of the Big Bang, the universe was energy uh, was radiation dominated. And so it grew according to the scale factor of the fourth power. Then, at about 50,000, or uh, roughly about 50,000 to 200,000 years after the Big Bang, roughly 50,000 years, the density, radiation density, dropped below the energy density due to matter. Matter grows less, uh, drops off less quickly with time, so therefore it will dominate the energy density. Radiation density just drops really fast as time goes on because of that extra power of A. So then for a long time, for over about from 50,000 years after the Big Bang, I, I missed it 200,000 a while ago, I mean 50. So 50,000 years after the Big Bang, up to about, see about 5 billion years after the Big Bang, 
uh, the universe was dominated, the dent matter, the density was dominated by matter, both dark matter and normal matter. And the universe expanded according to the density parameter of dark and normal matter. Now, about five billion years ago, the matter density dropped below that of the dark energy density, and the radiation density is already really, 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 really tiny compared to all that stuff. So right now, the universe is roughly most is is half is dominated by two terms, by normal matter and dark energy. However, in the future, the matter energy density will drop, 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 drop below that of dark energy, and you will find that in the far future, it will be dominated completely by dark energy, and that's what will happen in the future. So this one equation at the top shows how this graph comes about, how the universe expands with time. It depends on what's in the universe, whether it's dark matter, normal matter, radiation, curvature, or dark energy, and that determines how the Hubble parameter expands with time, and that is the expansion of the universe in an equation. So that's what we mean by it. That's what we mean by the expansion of the universe. It's governed by the Hubble parameter, which shows the scale factor, which then is related to what's in it. What, the, what is the energy density in it? And the energy density tells the Hubble parameter what to do. So the universe is expanding now. Therefore, in the past, the universe was smaller. All galaxies were closer together in space, and if you go back far enough in time, all galaxies and matter that are in our local observable universe were all in one place. And how far back we can go is what we call the age of the universe. And so Hubble time is the age of the universe. And if we take the reciprocal of the Hubble constant today, we find that that is an estimate of how long the universe has been expanding. So. The current level of the universe is roughly 70 kilometers per, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And if we convert that into just a time by taking its reciprocal and multiplying all these numbers together in a little calculator, I invite you to do that, you get about 14 billion years. So that's a good rough age of the universe is about 14 billion years. And due to the cosmic expansion, the rate of expansion has changed with time as we've seen by that graph and by as we've seen by this equation. We've seen that the, all of those parameters are important, more important, sometimes they're more important than others, and so we can eliminate them and ignore them, and that's what we do in physics. We say this equation is true across the board, but what's the dominant term? When is it dominant? We don't really, the crossover points are when it gets kind of mungy and we have two terms, or maybe three terms, or what have you, but Really, when it's dominant, there are this, this term dominates, that term dominates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if the expansion were faster in the past, then it would be slowed down by gravity, leading to an est overestimation. So, it's not constant. If the expansion were faster, then the universe has slowed down, and that th made us think that the universe is older. If the expansion were slower, then the expansion would have accelerated by something then there may be a something that is pushing on it, leading to an un underestimation of the age of the universe. Maybe that's the case. So all the total age of the universe is dependent not just on the reciprocal of the Hubble time, which is just an estimate, but how long it's been doing that thing according to this equation. And our big mystery is how much energy density is there in the cosmological constant? How much is there in matter, in normal matter? What is the total sum of all those things? So in order to understand that, we need to know the total sum. We need to now measure real too hard to measure numbers, the Hubble parameter, which gives us today how fast the universe is expanding right now. And we also need to measure the density parameter today, which measure, tells us how the matter and energy of the density affects the red expansion rate. We can, and you do include that cosmological constant in that thing because it seems like it could enhance the expansion rate and there is observational evidence for it. All of these things combined together tell us how old the universe is. With all of this stuff, Using certain numbers, uh, we what, have what we call the benchmark cosmology. If we set H0 by discovery and by experiment to 67.74, 
kilometers per second per megaparsec, and that's a measured object by, by, the, uh, by the Planck probe. And if we then measure the density parameter equal to matter plus lambda, meaning the cosmological constant equal to 1, we find that about 31% of the universe's energy density is, crit is matter, and about 69% of the universe's energy density is due to a cosmological constant. And the sum of those two things is 1, which is interesting. So the uh, cosmological constant, so the value of, the mat of that thing has, as from 30% is matter, 70% is from the energy density of cosmological energy. Since they're close to 1, the measured values are close to 1, we add them up. We live in an infinitely large, spatially flat, expanding universe that has no boundary. Wow. And that is consistent with the ages of the oldest rocks and oldest stars and the oldest stars in globular clusters and so on. And we have an estimate for the age of the universe at 13.799 billion years. That's our estimate, plus or minus 21 million years. That's a pretty good estimate, actually, if you think about it. All right, so what we see now, the universe is old, it's cold, it's low density, galaxies and all matter are getting further and further apart as space expands between them. As the universe expands, it cools even further. The and in the past, the universe must have been hotter and smaller and denser. Let's see next time if there's any evidence for this early, hot, dense phase of the universe. That's the hot Big Bang. I've given you the description of how things expand with time over time, but now where was that starting point? And that's the hot, dense phase we'll get to next time. And we'll see you soon.